These two look familiar. And so they should be, because they were among the very last of the dinosaurs. Triceratops is the big one, and the little one in front of him is Microceratops. These were the last dinosaurs because they lived right at the very end of the Mesozoic Age, in the light green Cretaceous period, remember? So they were some of the dinosaurs that could have been wiped out at the end of the Dinosaur Age? I'm afraid so, but don't feel too sad. Remember that you've seen all the main dinosaurs from over 140 million years. Plodders, bird-footed, fighting, armoured and the Ceratopsians. The last dinosaurs all in the space of three minutes. And each one of these different groups could contain anything up to almost a hundred different dinosaurs. So what are we waiting for? The, the plodding dinosaurs. The first of my dinosaur dozen. They were never too quick off the mark. The dinosaur dozen. Plodders! Some most very strange dinosaur names Try to say them out loud and then say them again Diplodocus, Vulcanodon and Plateosaurus Iguanodon, Deinonychus and Tyrannosaurus Triceratops, Ilophysis and Hype <gasps> Solophodon with Taurosaurus, Stegosaurus That's about enough of them <gasps> Baby Camosaurus Thicodontosaurus Massospondylus Vulcanodon Plateosaurus Riojosaurus, Cetiosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Mamankisaurus, Diplodocus, Supersaurus. Well, Dill, you know them all personally so much better than I do. Which of the dinosaurs is your favourite? Well, since you ask, I must admit, I've always had a bit of a soft spot for the plodders, the brontosaurs. They've always seemed to me to be exactly what a dinosaur should be. None of you rushing about, just slow and stately, plodding from one place to another. And for someone like me, who can barely reach more than three feet off the ground, just imagine the kind of view you'd get if you were a giant brontosaurus. Yes, that's the dinosaur I'd like to be. If I had been born a dinosaur I'd be the most gigantic size And almost as wide as a house I would be But I'd be quite gentle And live peacefully if I were a dinosaur rather than me If I had been born a dinosaur My neck would be extremely long so I could eat leaves from very high trees As well as small plants on the ground near my knees If I were a dinosaur rather than me well, as you can see, despite all my high-flying ideas, I've had to come down to Earth again. Mind you, it is a very special kind of Earth, because it was here, in this Sussex quarry, just an hour or so's journey from London, that the first dinosaur to be identified by man was found. That's because over a hundred million years ago, Back in the Mesozoic Age, the age of the dinosaurs, there were all kinds of crocodiles and dinosaurs living here where Britain is. That's right. Dinosaurs were right here in England. Mind you, it all looks very different today, though. Just as it did when Dr and Mrs Mantell first came across the scene back in 1822.
Dr. Mantell had come to visit a patient of his just along the road. And as it was such a beautifully warm summer's day, his wife Mary had come along for a ride. Well, she didn't want to be bothered with looking over her husband's shoulder all the time, so off she went for a short walk. But barely had she begun than her attention was drawn to the middle of a pile of rubble being used to mend the road. For there, in the middle of a pile of rough sandstone, was the oddest looking stone she had ever seen. It was dark brown and shiny, with a smooth, polished surface. And as she looked at it more closely, she suddenly realised what it was. The dark brown stone she was holding was a giant tooth, and there were many more crushed together in the sandstone nearby. She rushed to tell her husband of her amazing find. There could be teeth. Where did you find them? Down the lane. And together, they traced the source of the mysterious giant teeth back to a local sandstone quarry. Now, although Dr. Mantell and his wife knew that what they had found were fossils, animal bones that had been in the ground so long that they had turned to stone, neither of them knew for certain the name of the animal the teeth had come from. This was hardly surprising, for ever since the 17th century, people have been finding strange bones and fossils in the soil and stones of the south of England. Some thought them to be the remains of a race of giants that once lived in the area. Others believed them to be all that was left of a mythological collection of devils, dragons and fairy tale monsters. Well, the Mantells knew a little more than that. They remembered barely a dozen years earlier a girl called Mary Anning, who lived in the Lyme Regis area of Dorset in southern England. She had found, amongst other fossils, the complete fossilised remains of a prehistoric fish lizard, the Ichthyosaurus. Because Dr. Mantell knew that like the Lias rock that Mary Anning had found her fossils in, the sandstone rocks surrounding the teeth were very old, going back almost 100 million years, he knew that the teeth must have come from the same period of prehistoric time. But how could a thing as solid as a tooth find its way into something as solid as a rock? The answer is that when the tooth first fell into the rock, the rock wasn't rock at all, but simply a layer of rather sandy mud lying at the bottom of a stream or a swamp. You can see exactly what happens if you pour plaster into a dish and then drop a chicken bone into it. The plaster gradually traps the chicken bone in the same way that the mud gradually settled around the dinosaur bones. Then as time went on, more layers of mud formed on top of the bone and it gradually became covered. Of course! The sandstone rock took millions of years to set properly. Our plaster mix, on the other hand, should be set solid in a very short time. Then, millions of years after the rock had been covered by more and more layers of new rock, certain parts were slowly weathered away by the wind and sea to expose the old bones. In this case, the process has only taken a few minutes. Now you can split open your rock, Dill, to find your original bone. <laughs> And that's exactly what Mary Anning and the Mantells had to do, to split open their fossil finds. Except that they were dealing with much harder rocks and stones. That's right. And there's another important difference too. You see, we know exactly what's inside our fossil, but Dr. Mantell and the other early fossil hunters were not at all sure where the bones they had found had come from. One sunny spring day in 1822, in the little Sussex town of Lewis, when Dr. Mantell's young lady wife was out walking one day just enjoying her life what did she see here there on the ground 
something dark and shiny and brown. It was the very first tooth of a dinosaur, the very first tooth that was found.